Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody's in good spirits for today's session. We're going to wait for just a minute more and then start off. People are still coming in. Yes, well, we are uh, recording on Facebook and on, uh, so we are ready. So you can All start. Right. So, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in today. Uh, as you know, we are here today for a discussion on habitats for butterflies. This is uh, part of our series of workshops that we want to do. But before building on to these workshops, we thought to get like-minded people together in a virtual room and uh, try and have an open house. So we'll start off with a few questions that uh, uh, have come to us online, and then uh, we'll open it up for uh, everybody to get an opportunity to ask a question. So I hope you guys are all uh, enjoying Big Butterfly Month and you're counting butterflies, watching butterflies, sharing that knowledge with uh, others and, of course, sharing the joy of butterfly watching too. Uh, today, we have uh, Arjun Basu Roy with us. He heads Nature Mates and uh, has been a leading light, I would say, in uh, the field of butterfly conservation. He's learned from the best in the uh, industry and uh, he's followed the best practices and he's involved a lot of people in this effort. Uh, I met Arjun at Baksa for the first time and uh, as you might all know, Baksa Tiger Reserve is a heaven for butterflies and uh, seeing his ded dedication and the work he was doing and his team the talent that the team has. Uh, I went to visit uh, their butterfly park in uh, at the Eco Park, Salt Lake City, Calcutta. And uh, I was amazed by the work they are doing there and uh, uh, amazed by the people attached with the program, the kind of uh, research labs they have. And I was really taken aback by dedicated people trying to spread the right message. It's at times is really tough, but spread the right message to, you know, reach out to maximum people, hundreds of people coming into the butterfly park, trying to learn about butterflies, um, uh, lots of interns trying to learn uh, about research on butterflies, uh, people building habitats. So Arjun has been building habitats all across Eastern India, I would say and uh, he has a few in Calcutta itself. So for today's session, uh, we're going to have Arjun here with us today and uh, we're missing Vijay. Vijay had some emergency to attend to, so uh, he will probably join in in some time, hopefully. Uh, with that, I would like uh, Arjun to start off. Uh, Arjun, if you would start off by telling us uh, how you got into butterflies and uh, why butterfly habitats? So, uh, good evening, everybody. So, it's it's uh, my coming to butterflies uh, was way back in early 2000. So, as usual, like many other nature enthusiasts, uh, I am also into birding. I love to go behind birds in my very young, uh, in my, you know, very early days when I was in my school. So, uh, but at, uh, at around 2000, late 1998, 99 onwards, I got into, um, I got interested in butterflies as well. 
and then we have a very uh, you know we have a uh, uh, person known as uh, shubhankar da shubhankar patro he was a uh, guru to all of us in many ways so we used to go for you know nature walks every uh, every sunday on it's almost like a ritual that we will be going out to some places in and around kolkata every sunday and from there i get into butterflies one of the major reason is you know uh, i can take a photo of a butterfly much better than a photo of a bird because i don't have a telephoto lens at the time so photography helps me you know to get engaged with butterflies more and more and eventually i fall in love with it and uh, also during that period the butterfly india yahoo group kicks off vijay barve take a lead in you know communicating with people who are into butterflying who are running behind butterflies so so all these things happen simultaneously in in a in a span of 3 4 years and uh, i became a permanent uh, uh, butterfly watcher initially then eventually i get in get in uh, get along with many other aspects of butterflying and now i am uh, definitely we are as a group nature mates we are a team now and it's not about me it's about us and we are into butterfly habitat making we are into serious research on various aspects of butterflies and uh, on, uh, we are also into regular monitoring of butterflies at different different places in west bengal we are mostly active but we are uh, we are doing work in many other states in many other places as well so uh, this is how i get into it and then if you love butterfly what 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 uh, what actually put me into making habitats for butterflies is when i love butterfly i like to have them around me so when i when i thought of seeing butterfly sitting at kolkata i found that all our you know when we were child when we were kid when we are just in our 10 11 years of age we get to see a lot of butterflies in and around kolkata everywhere there were butterflies and when i was in the early 2000 when i was looking for butterflies from a very different uh, you know in a in a much focused way i start finding that they are not there anymore in that way what we have seen in early 90s in early 2000 they were completely out of the main kolkata area in most of the places from most of the places and then i actually uh, thought of doing something uh, uh, you know doing something for them so that i can get to see them in and around me means around me around my place that's very important because butterfly is a thing that directly relates with my well being i i i live a better peaceful life when i see butterflies around so it's it's a selfish uh, triumph i want to satisfy my you know need to see butterfly around me and from there i started uh, creating butterfly gardens yeah, I, my first my first uh, trial was at purulia where i learned a lot of things about butterflies it's uh, around 2004 2005 2006 7 4 years i spent a lot of time in purulia running behind butterflies in panchet hills around panchet hills in biharna hills in ajodhya hills and in many other places in villages in and around those areas and we tried our hand in a place called gor panchakot the first butterfly garden i tried to make uh, it's all happened because of ujjal ghosh sir he was then the dfo at that place and me and ujjal ghosh sir we tried a lot we first we trust and when we fanatically take, uh, start taking photographs of different different species which are very unknown to me at that point of time those are not seen in kolkata the purple leaf blue the uh, short tails you know the taraxes all those were very very interesting and you know we were like you know fanatically we start chasing them the baronet and all other butterflies mm -hmm. and we started our garden that was initially we have we were clueless about how to go about it so we thought of putting a uh, plenty of nectar plants we did that many butterflies came but not all of them and they didn't stay there for long 
eventually after that i get a chance to go to japan uh, you know i went there as a, in in a spouse visa along with my wife who was doing her postdoctoral research in japan and when i was there i would have i was not doing anything i was just looking for something and i actually wrote a post in internet that i want to see butterflies of japan is there anybody who can help me out after 7 8 days i got a call from a person uh, from a very far distance means in the northernmost island uh, motoki san and he called me and said are you sure that you want to look for butterflies in japan i said yes i am very sure <laughs> i told that i have seen at least 500 species of butterflies in india by then and i am really looking forward to see some of the butterflies of japan and some of the habitat and it was very curious and then he said my friend will meet you in a place called tanomiya in kobe and uh, and when i went to that place i found four very uh, well relatively aged man i was in my early 30s at that point of time 11 years back and they were like 60 60 plus people and they were like started interrogating me that you are this young and you have seen 500 butterflies how come we are looking for butterflies for the last 40 years and we haven't seen more than 200 species yet i was a bit confused at what to answer what what can be my answer for this i was when you know feeling very uncanny that four four japanese with very peculiar english accent than you know but uh, their english is when i it's very very tough to understand and very funny at point of time but i was like questioned by them like anything and then i suddenly asked what is the diversity of japan they said we have 249 butterflies i said we have 1500 butterflies i haven't seen one third of my butterflies and you have seen almost 80% of your butterflies that's the difference then they okay then they got a bit relaxed and then after a while you know they are almost crying that arjun you are so young and you are looking for butterflies none of the people mane none of our children none of our grandchildren are interested in it anymore no one is looking for butterflies you will see only old people in the when you want to see butterflies in japan and this and that and eventually they adopted me almost they took me to places in japan to showcase what <laughs> their butterflies and i was like you know i was so privileged because those people are you know they are very important in my life in my you know in my triumph for knowing butterflies spending time with butterflies then i start visiting various butterfly gardens of japan because i had that in my mind that i will be doing some garden sometime in in my own place so i visited the itami insect museum garden it's one of the very big garden in japan i want i went to the mino garden i went to ozikuen zoo garden i went to many other gardens almost all, all the gardens which are around and which are not very you know far away from my place of stay because then i have to commute and in japan public transport even is quite costly so i have to balance all those things because jimli was only earning then i was not doing anything i didn't i have not done anything in japan apart from uh, you know roaming around but from japan around uh, after 4 months and when i get back to kolkata in 2009 november i got a call from one of our forest officer uh, mr nilanjan mollik that they want to do something in salt lake central park and can i create a butterfly garden from them for them because ujjal ghosh sir has recommended me that yes arjun is there he can do a butterfly garden at solle i jumped into that i literally jumped into that because i was you know i have seen so many gardens i have volunteered in all those gardens i asked them that can i do something in the garden they said what you can do you don't know japanese you cannot interact with people but i said but i can take care of the butterflies i can look for whatever you ask me to do i can clean the, uh, the boxes i can do anything so they allowed me allowed me and they they actually trained me a lot in different different way because the work culture in japan is so very good they are so meticulous 
you know in their you know and they're so so passionate about the whole thing in japan there is no forest department there is one animal welfare department and they are mostly into you know dogs and cats more like that the entire forest of japan is private owned they collect butterflies like anything but they know about their butterflies so well that you know they can manage the population in a fantastic manner the first day i went to see butterfly in japan it was a very very unique experience in my life so four of them one of them one of the person who was a sort of leader in that group mr tatuya san tatuya san was uh, we went to a place for butterflies i, I exactly it in it in uh, i forgot the name of the place itself anyhow i went to see butterflies and those are you know the some pieces of fire as the hair stick butterflies very beautiful looking butterflies and they took me to that place for that particular two three species of pieces of fire but for yeah. me in japan every butterfly is a new butterfly so i was yes. done to each and everything whatever i am seeing i am photographing and i was like you know a copper a hedge blue a this a that so i was running behind all the butterflies i am seeing so but i i i found that they are not happy with you know the way i am doing so they discuss something in between and then they took a ladder asked me to get into the get into a quite high branch of a tree of a oak tree mm. and i went up satya san went behind me up to that branch he tipped me on that branch literally tipped me and asked me to stand there and look for the pieces of fire because you are here to look for that but why you are running here and there you you are you are losing your focus and you will miss the you know the butterfly we are here to show you so i was like uh, then what will happen because i am standing in one place and the butterfly will come to me they said yes they will come to you at peak at 3 pm around and that was around 2 to 10 like that so said, so i have to stand here in the branch the for the next one hour they said, yes you have to concentrate because they don't give you much time you have to take photo you take your you know exposure you take your this and that and you yeah. you concentrate be ready yeah be ready <laughs> so i have to stand on a tree top on a branch tip i can't move much <laughs> and just at around 3 3:5 those hair stick from nowhere they start flying around and mm. these two dog fighting you know two of the males will chase each other they will go very high up and they will come down sit for a millisecond and then they again start doing that round and and they, uh, it's 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 wonderful the whole whole ambience was so good you are on top of a canopy it's quite high yeah. and you are you, you can't move much and so you have to wait because they have uh, set me in a way that i get a very good light i get a good you know uh, watching in front of me where the mm-hmm. this hair stick tends to you know stop for a momentary stop for the momentary stop and i was shooting them i go, i went crazy and when i get down i get to know that these people are so much into the ethology of butterfly which is absolutely missing at least at that point of time for me i i, I will not say for others because i don't know how they used to work at that point of time but these people they get me into the ecological part not only the ecological part also the ecological part of the uh, insect the solitary insect which is very very interesting and i am i i i was completely in it from then means from 2009 my way of looking at butterflies changed uh, changed it completely changed when i came back in 2009 it meant i i came back in october and in by end of november we are already into making a butterfly garden in the sol lake central park uh, sir told me that we don't have much funds so you be slow i said forget about funds let me do what i want to do first and then i will think of money money is secondary then i am getting a land parcel i am getting at least some support from you that's more than anything i can ask for at that point of time because i was i just learned i was absolutely charged up and i got uh, immediate scope 
in the first year we released around 2000 butterflies and in in india in entire india there were no gardens at that point of time with a proper lab facility where yes. butterfly rearing is happening you know i know about a couple of garden at that point of time one is at kpri kerala forest research institute that garden was one of the garden that was surviving when it means there are here and there people are trying to make butterfly gardens one or two but there is no as such garden what i have seen in japan actually here yeah, the thing is in japan it's not a uh, it's not a it's in a temperate zone so throughout the year the temperature is fluctuating in a very uh, broad range it means during the winter almost more than 6 months the temperature lies below the you know butterfly comfort zone so all those gardens are completely weather weather controlled garden and for them the rearing facility is a must because they keep the larva very properly they take care of them very properly so that went into my mind that in india i don't need a garden which has weather control but i definitely need a lab where i have a control on you know uh, on my butterfly life cycle stages various stages of life cycle so from my understanding look i'm i'm a student of uh, i'm an engineer by training so all my learning are from nature directly whatever i know about this subject i i know it from my experience with spending time with them i i have not read many books i have not read many literature at that point of time google was not like it is today so we i i was learning i i i uh, you know i started nature makes when i was in my class 9 standard so i was deeply into nature study from a very young age and i was learning everything from nature itself means i spent a good amount of time with butterflies birds in the in the fields in orchards you know in villages and whatever i have learned at till that point of time say it is say it's ecology or ecology or whatever it is not from the book not from any person but from my own you know observations uh, in the field with the animals with the plants etc and definitely uh, that was helped by shubhankar da a lot because we were very regular out in the field we all were learning but shubhankar da was anchoring the he was the steward of that group who meticulously took us to this places you know it was very disciplined outing we were all of us are in time in the early morning train to uh, you know he dictated us which coach we have to avail when we have to get down what we have to carry you always bring your umbrella always bring your water you need to have some snacks so he gave a detailed guideline what to, what we have to do on that morning and we were very regular and we were like you know following him but the learning was very original way of learning means you know we all go out we we have our own area of interest and we start we just keep on documenting all those things we ask questions to each other what you are feeling about this is the number is going down is the number is coming up and we usually go to a place repetitively means uh, in a year maybe we cover uh, we have 52 sundays so may, maybe we have covered 15 places two three times a year so you know we know the seasonal vari variations we know what is happening during the winter what in which places the butterflies are better in the pre monsoon and in which places they are better in during the post monsoon which is the best time to see them which is not the best time to see them and everything and all those things are in our mind from the natural existence from it's not at all academic it's all about our observations and our learning from nature so when i get the scope to interact in those butterfly gardens in japan and you know they allowed me to work with them as a volunteer for on a regular basis i i went to those gardens on a regular basis for three months almost in japan all the weekdays i spent it there they allow me to enter their garden after after two three visits they allow me to enter their garden without the ticket which is quite a costly thing so they saw that a person is here in japan and and my friends were you know they were perplexed you are not going to any mall you are not going to these you are not going to lab hotel and you are going for butterflies i said yes i'm very happy with butterflies and this is entirely a new way of looking at it mm -hmm. 
So in uh, Bonavitan, we started creating the habitat along with the butterfly lab. Now there is no money. So Sir said, I don't have a room. I said, okay, you have a, uh, you have a place. And uh, you no, know, they have a uh, uh, water tank, uh, you know, on four columns. Mm. And there were no uh, terrace in between those columns. It's, it's three-storied high, but there is no internal terrace in between. So I said, sir, if you can please arrange a, you know, convert it into a room, any type of room that will do to start with. Sir said, okay, I have this much of money, you know, I can make a room out of it. It will not cost me a lot. So I got my first butterfly lab, which was a cycle stand actually under a water tank. <laughs> in, that, in that lab, I was the first, the first butterfly larvae that we collected is of a common Palm fly. Rudro uh, said, look, this is how you have to look for larvae, you know. Well, he actually hold on to a leaf of a, you know, Erika palm and, he, and there was a larva. It's like magic. Mm -hmm. Rudro touched it and you know, I got the larva. <laughs> so, and Shubankarda used to spend time there. Raghunarda used to spend time there. Shomo, Orpon, many of the, you know, young brigade who are in who are with us at that point of time in nature made they spent a lot of time and there was a person there was a gorkha um, uh, you know guy called Ran Singh Tamang. Ran Singh was a caretaker of Konobita but uh, sir said I don't have money for anything now so I <laughs> start pampering Ran Singh ki aap aajao mere ko thora help kar do main tumko thora tha dunga alag se so Ran Singh was a fabulous guy he, he has uh, you know, he has taught me many a thing. And he was from hills. So he is very good with leaves, he was good with insects and others. And then Dhan Singh, me, Kamalika, uh, Devapriya, Shomo, all, all, all these people, uh, Shuvankarta definitely, Radhanatha definitely, and many others, many others. I, uh, if I have to name, I have to name 50 people, I think, at that point of time, who has, you know, voluntarily, because we don't have any fund for anybody. So I used to uh, board a bus from Jadupur. I get down at the stoppage. It's a it's a one bus travel. It it will take around 45, 50 minutes for me, and I spend the entire afternoon at that place, looking uh, uh, you know bringing in seeds during all our Sunday visit. We start collecting seeds from here and there, and we are sowing all those in different different places. We we got three small pocket of land. And at the end of the year, we found that we have raised more than 2,500 butterflies from that lab, from the converted cycle stand lab. Yeah. And that impressed Mr. Mollik a lot. Then he properly made that room. And then in 2010, one good thing happened. Dev Sena and Sarika joined Nature Med. Sarika was a very uh, difficult guy. She was very different from many others I know of. So when she came, I said, you know, you have to get a first division in your master, then only you can work for. Me. I just say, it. I just say it because I have nothing. I have no revenue. I can't share any money with them. I can't give anything to them. And you know they are very good in their studies. Sarika was studying uh, nutrition from Calcutta University, which is a very good course. And she was already working with uh, some you know hospitals as nutrition and dietitian, and they were doing a lot of. Uh, tuition, they, were, you know, they were giving tuitions to kids. So they were having some money and, you know, I just want to spoil their setup and, you know, make into them into a, uh, you know, uh, for a purpose which is having no assurance of, you know, any fund at that any point future, of time. Yes. But Sarika took up the whole thing uh, in a very unique way because she is a very good learner and she learned a lot of things during her upbringing in her own hometown means where she lived and she has a very keen eye she she take out many things absolutely by her own when I, when I she learned almost everything by her own because that's how i learned and that's how i usually ask people to get their learning that you do and then we will see what what is happening so i i don't, I don't like to you know uh, you know dictate someone that you have to do this and that it's it's very tough the way but if you really, uh, you know, get into the whole thing, then you will get 
immense confidence at one point of time and you can do many a thing all your uh, along the line so sarika after sarika and devsana joined nature mate the whole scenario of nature mate starts changing we we are looking for more projects we are looking for more many uh, many other things and sarika changed the whole uh, way of our work in the banobitan we start doing some small small in observations we start keeping the records very many I mean, very properly yes. in a very intrinsic manner and eventually i get sarika in touch with krishna meg and others who are working in the field she and we we start getting other projects as well and and at that point of time we are rearing around 5000 butterflies in banobitan already and we are bringing in many many host plants we are we are observing many new host plants as well because no one has picked those it's not that yes. suddenly a butterfly select a new host plant it's always there it's there for maybe 100 years maybe more than that maybe 500 years we have not seen it because we are not looking for them in that way in that with that passion and with that you know i say discipline because whenever you are into nature study whenever you are working with nature discipline is a must because all the elements of nature they are very very disciplined i have never seen a bird who is a late riser i have never mm. seen a butterfly who go out in the night other than the common evening by <laughs> in our houses so they are they are very very disciplined in their own way and if you really want to work with them you have to with them there is no other i mean i don't no any shortcut for this you have to be very disciplined and you have to be very regular because they do things every day and you have to be there every day to understand what are what they doing at what point of time exactly. at which, which time of the day and all those things so this is how i get into making butterfly habitat eventually we get a chance to make habitat at ramsai in gorumara then in baksa all those are our dream project and then we also did a lot of butterfly garden in west bengal in many other places in schools in colleges many of them are like you know here i must say there are a significant number of garden which is happening around india now right now which is a lot mane which is unthinkable at 2009 when we started doing it are a significant number of them are happening just because the sake of doing it there is no planning how to maintain it so whenever you are getting into a task of making a habitat or creating a habitat or restoring a habitat one time investment monetarily time wise is fine many can afford but the recurring experience the recurring maintenance of it the money and the time to yes. get it found the effort it has to be so uh, so precise and so regular that you cannot afford to even Uh, you know uh, allow it to be on its own for some a month or so it can change the whole direction of your project so uh, so that's one one of the area that's the, the, that's the basic of my uh, coming into butterflies so and in it's, fa- it's a fascinating story like i always have told you also that uh, uh, being around you it reflects on how you have learned from being out there in the field as well as you know uh, your way of connecting with the right people and getting help with no ego just you know oh, getting help another, another thing i must say in 2007 2006 onwards i get in touch with vijay and then i was into you know vijay is like my elder brother mane vijay is someone very special in my life and it's a it's a life long thing i know but there is no way i can be detached from vijay anymore uh, that i can say about krishna meg i can say about you as well so butterfly india yahoo group is a family at that point of time i am blessed to be a part of it from the very almost from the beginning I mean after 2 3 years of it starting i uh, i must say a few name nelson rodriguez balakrishnan valapil varesh mm. Uh, all our amboli friends I mean parag and hemant hemant uh, doctor sir there are so many people who are like you know who are a friend of your life and we are so relaxed with each other we i know that i have 
if i go, if i'm going to goa i have to see places to live without any hesitation i can and one thing also happened at that point of time when i was going a bit into butterflying more than just looking at butterflies i started looking for people who are working i started looking for books so i found krishna me book i found mina horibol's book i found isaac's book was there you know the, the small book which was published from wwf it was there with me for long, long back, the yes. big book big book has not come at that point of time so i contacted them over phone there was i don't have emails I, uh, I do have emails, but then the social media platforms were not there. We only have output. So Vijay connected me over output. Uh, Krishna Meg was never there in social media. So did Isaac. So I found their phone number. I rang up Krishna Meg. I sent, and I, I also published a book in 2007, 50 Butterflies of Bengal Plains, because what I found is there is no handy book around, which, mm. you know, common people can use. I mean, it's not an academic book. It's a very simple pictorial guide, but that was a very, uh, what I found very important for us because that gives me a confidence that, okay, at least I know 50 species from my place. And then when I wrote that book, I wanted to get the feedback from all the stalwarts in the in this subject. And I connected with all of them. I, I somehow found Minagi. I somehow get in touch with Kushname. I got in touch with Isaac, and they are they are like they are phenomenal. Students. They are very good people, and they are real, real good teachers. Uh, you know, when I am talking with Isaac Kinkar for the first time, it's something very different. I cannot explain it. So I asked Shushamik. I I was clueless about his age. When I was first <laughs> writing to him because it was such a big book, and you know, such so academic. I mean, it's a it's a very Peninsular you know, India, the book. Peninsular. Yeah, Peninsular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was for me yeah, also. I, it was I, really heavy. I, I was clueless about a, a younger guy like Kiki had wrote it, so I have no idea of his age. So I asked him, "How old are you?" <laughs> <laughs> Kiki sent me back a picture with a you know buffalo, uh, you know buffalo skull. He's uh, you know having a buffalo skull on his head, holding a buffalo skull on his head. And said, I am not very old. <laughs> 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 we and in 2007, KK came to India and uh, he was at my place. So we were like, you know, we bonded very well from the very beginning. And it's a, it's a, it's a good way of interaction because he is very serious about the subject and he is now taking a very uh, big responsibility of, you know, training Sarika, Orko, Orchon, and many of all of us. Rather, I, mean, I must say, in the Finer aspects of you know butterfly study from various angles and various. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, Minaji also wrote me back. I uh, we published a uh, we we used to publish a, a magazine called Loptulia. So in 2008, I published one edition of it, covering the butterfly India meet we organized in Baksa, where uh, Krishna Meg, Isaac G, Minaji, everyone had an article, had given me an article. Vijay had also given me an article. So it was a uh, thing that I always try to contact, uh, get in touch with people who knows the subject. And I was, you know, I was fearless because I'm here to learn. I, 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 I was never here to teach anybody anything. I was here to learn. Even today I am learning. And till the last day I will be working, I will be learning more than, you know, uh, you, anything you. else. A few very important things uh, from this very fascinating uh, story, Arjun. Uh, one, that it's important to uh, get the right sort of exposure in the sense that, uh, like you said, I can relate to that story of going to parks, going to different gardens, trying to understand uh, what works, what doesn't work, what are the great parts about uh, and how people are working in these areas. and. Uh, uh, I must say, uh, 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 the butterfly community in India is actually a really amazing group of people. Yeah. Really helpful. You go to anybody, they're always open. There is no, uh, you know, there is no uh, ulterior motive or anything. It's just the love of butterflies. I think butterflies bring this out in people of sharing uh, the knowledge, spreading it. I can totally relate to your... 50 butterfly booklet 
because you know you were getting to learn and you're like oh i have faced these uh, i face these uh, problems so how how do i make it simpler for the people who follow exactly. so that is that's actually that's a really that's... really uh, uh, amazing thing to hear that the experiences have been similar and how um, people have helped out and this is what i think we're trying to build here since we've been talking about big butterfly month and the habitat theme that we have this year that uh this group which is in today it's not just a one time engagement that we want to sit on a virtual meeting and tell them how to build it it's a, a lifetime of bonding over plants growing uh, butterflies uh, laying eggs lots of butterflies meeting you see this around and uh, getting to know even more people uh, with the medium of butterflies and people getting to know about butterflies so uh, uh, really amazing but uh, i'll ask you a question starting off now i'll answer i'll i'll tell you what i think about it and then i'll open it up to you so the question is uh, people ask me when people ask me what uh, is the most important thing about building a butterfly habitat and my answer is simple you need a butterfly right it's that story of um, uh, uh, if you any garden can be turned into a butterfly garden if you have a person there spending time locating butterflies looking at them observing them uh, how your japanese friends could predict right so i have met people who do that who have so much interest and that's what makes a butterfly habitat and we have been building this corridor in delhi and it's not our work it's not my team's work even it's these people who come uh, to us saying that we want to build what what is needed what can we do how can we help and it's been so successful just based on this these people they take up the responsibility they are eager to learn they are eager to put in sometimes even their own money to get this going uh, get parcels of land from their colonies from uh, uh, other organizations and they're willing to put in that time and i think that's the real important thing about butterfly habitats what do you think is the most important thing about building a butterfly habitat when you start building a habitat what is the most important thing? it's 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 look uh, uh, so well, what you said is oh, is what i my feeling is actually so the thing is uh, if you really want to actually we cannot create a habitat the way we are saying when we can actually nourish it into a better shape exactly. habitat is already there yes. butterflies are already there yes. their visibility is restricted because we are not looking at them with time so even in a very good garden if you go there for 15 minutes you can be disappointed i can assure you if you go there for 5 hours you will be feeling like you are blessed because you have seen more than 40 45 species in a day yes. in an urban setup so it's not about we create habitat we make the make the already existing habitat you know we, we prepare it in a way so that the visibility of butterflies get in hand we don't bring butterflies we don't bring larvae species from other places to a place to a habitat no? so i i i if you look it into a philosophical way my idea of creating habitat is very simple like so hell i am asking you to come to my place for dinner so in general what we do is i cook something which i am good in cooking or which i like the most which fits my budget which is you know something of sort of standard thing and i serve it to you but when i am feeding a habitat for butterflies and you are a butterfly say so i will not serve you what i want to serve i will ask you so help what you love to eat at during dinner you may say puff rice and pani and some you know some sweets yes. it's not something very standard it's not something very you know unique but you like it the most and you know your dinner is very important because it give you a good sleep if you are happy with what you have ate and if you ate something that is of my choice not yours but as you are a guest you cannot say no and you have to eat it you can never be happy so my way of creating habitat is i look for a place definitely there are 2 4 5 1 2 4 5 butterflies so i go to each and one of them how i go i follow them i 
look at them. I wait for them to do something. And I found, try to find their comfort zone. I try to find what they are doing, what they are utilizing. And I just make sure what they are utilizing, those things are in abundance in that habitat. I do nothing else. Exactly, yes. So I allow them to focus themselves and I ensure that they get their comfort zone in that habitat. So when, if I go to your place and I get to eat the thing I like, I get to sleep in a bed, you know, exactly the bed I like to sleep in, a bit hard, not very, you know, soft, you know, it's a bit big because I'm not very thin a guy. And, you know, then I get to read some books which I like to read. I, I get a good toilet with a good commode and, you know, it's comfortable toilet, it's clean. And then you have a good terrace, I can spend some time in the evening or in the morning. So your home, though it's your home, but I will, I, 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 I truly found a comfort zone in your home. So my visit to your home will increase because I know if I'm not happy, if I really want some company, Swell Space has all the things which I like to have in and around me. That's how I create the habitat. And, you know, we think that they cannot, they don't talk, they don't interact the way we, but all these animals have their own way of communication. If a set of common immigrants, you know, find various species of say, cassia, get good nectaring flowers, get a good place to sleep, they will bring others. The look where we stay is very good. You don't need to fly here and there and, you know, you can get good food, good place to stay, uh, stay at night and, you know, there are lots of other things happening. So come, come and stay at my place for a day or two. And this is how they bring more butterflies and when there is a will of other, when I say one or two species, when they get in, when, it, when the number goes up, that brings different species also because they are inquisitive. What, why these guys are there in numbers? And when they come in, I, I saw a new one coming. I, I, I again start researching on its comfort zone. I ensure that that thing goes up. And eventually, this is how we make the habitat more habitable for more and more species in good numbers. Simple. There is no magic in it. There is a deep respect for the butterflies. For them, yes. For my own knowledge. It's not about what I know. It's all about what I am learning from them, what I am founding. You know, that's why, you know, there is no prototype. I, I can give you a list of 50 plants and you will never be able to make a good garden. Hmm. Because it's not about 50 plants which the butterfly likes the most. Yes. It's about butterflies of your place, what they are liking the most. It can be very different from what the, they are liking at my place. So exactly, yes. The same piece at your place may like something else and in my place may like something else. Exactly. So this is an understanding that helps me a lot while I'm creating habitat. And I am absolutely depend, I, I depends entirely on butterflies or birds whenever I'm creating some habitat because I'm making it for them, not for my own thing. It's not my thing. It's their thing. I'm just facilitating. So I deeply respect their choices and do the thing. It may, no, may not look very, you know, classy. It may not look very shiny, but it will be full of butterflies you can trust them. So Arjun, this is uh, actually a very important point that you brought up that uh, people get hung up on the list of uh, host plants or some plants that you can give me, I can plant those and, you know, there'll be a butterfly habitat, butterflies will start flowing in. It actually doesn't work like that. It actually needs this person inquisitive enough to respect the butterflies to tell that person, he or she, what is needed in habitat, what do they require, what is their comfort zone. And like you rightly said, different butterflies, uh, same but butterflies of the same species in different places behave differently and they have different needs and uh, different wants. And if you keep your mind open, keep your eyes open, uh, put in the effort, see these butterflies, enjoy it, it will act actually come to you very Absolutely. simply. Absolutely how to utilize these plants, what to do with it. Like I say, it's ABC, very easy to build a butterfly garden. You uh, see what butterflies are around you, you plant the appropriate plants, but it doesn't work with that ABC. You need to go beyond it. You need to study butterflies, feel their behavior. You, you need to give some time to them. 
you know yes. what happened during this corona so what happened if you i, I got up with corona in march yes. so i got a prescription i went to a doctor my doctor is good enough to share a online prescription with me and then every next person who got corona who asked me for the prescription and i said yes this is what i'm taking many of them actually start having those without consulting doctor and then you know it's it's like that there is a prescription for a corona patient and you are also having corona but the prescription varies with your body weight with your you know uh, diet with your you know other things comorbidity yes, yes, yes. so it's not that if you have corona you have a set of prescription which can cure you it happened in, in it happened in throughout india so somebody got corona he got some prescriptions and that was followed by 15 people at least absolutely i got when i got corona in september i got prescriptions in my whatsapp everybody has the first okay. message they're like okay you have corona and take and this prescription you then choose the best looking prescription and start following that it's not so butterfly garden it's not a prescription thing it's you have to give time to that place you have to feel for them you have to have a very keen eye you have to have a very minute uh, way of looking at butterflies you know what they are doing even small things you need to need to note down you have to carry your notebook all the time and then eventually you create a garden definitely there are certain common elements which will be there in the garden like lime plants you know uh, recently we made a contractor you know who is a pwd contractor a very big guy talking of gardens of crows and you know many few crows rather and he said i know i know i know that curry leaf and you know lime will give butterflies i know nothing compared to you but i know this much i said okay you know <laughs> what you should not know actually <laughs> the obvious things but yes there are certain obvious things like if you have some good looking flowers butterflies love to venture out in you know like me if there is a good food good looking food i will try so for nectar they are quite open if it's a good nectar many of the butterfly can even try a new plant which is not commonly found in that place but for host they are like they are very choosy and they are very very localized choices are there and you have to value those choices you have to value those choices you cannot put your choice into making a butterfly mate and you know breed in a plant of your choice rather than their choice absolutely with this um, i'll take up a question arjun from the uh, internet actually the forms that we sent out Uh, it's related to what we were talking about uh the question is why are butterfly enthusiasts and butterfly gardens perpetuating invasive plants sterile or fertile the material what you saying look uh, so this is a big uh, debate arjun you know this is a big debate on native plants and you know wild plants exotic plants you know uh, this exotic indigenous this and that but uh, and 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 we always try to propagate native plants native plants native plants to begin with you know to begin with i was deadly against butterfly collection now we are a part as a team we are a part of you know the butterfly collection group that we are collecting different butterflies from different places with permission proper permission for for the study because at one point of time i found it quality and in eventually i get to an understanding that to understand butterfly physiology its various needs and its genetics and all other things you need specimen and you you also need to know how to collect it how to preserve it and how to value a specimen so initially we are like we only plant native things we just ignore all the so called invasive so called other things now the first thing is who said this is invasive one species is saying this is invasive not the other species. we the human being so what is a weed who said that this is a weed and this is not a weed because this is having some value and this is having some having no value you cannot buy a plant it is a weed you can buy a plant it's not a weed mm. so these are general perceptions you know we did value additions with our choices and which is which you can buy in a nursery is not a weed and which you cannot buy in a nursery which happen to grow here and there at a, around your place naturally mostly they are some than weeds so this is all about how you are 
conceptualizing conceptualizing the whole thing what i say rather than saying native and indigenous and exotic and non native thing what i now try to say is what what are the plants which are adopted by the local biodiversity and what are the plants which are not adopted by the local biodiversity i can give you a very common example Please. there is a group of plants which are plumeria plumeria is used by the architects and landscapers across the globe in a fanatic way mm. it's a very good looking plant it's really really good looking it blooms throughout the year in many cases it has beautiful broad leaf green very beautiful architecture of the plant but you will hardly find any bird nesting on that plant in india you will hardly find any butterfly nectaring on that plant or roosting on that plant so that is a plant which is exotic non native and non adopted by the local biodiversity so we have to be very careful about not to put in such plants yes they are needed because aesthetically they look very good but it, along with aesthetics we have to give value to you know uh, some other things like how much they are supporting the local biodiversity because even if you are putting a plant it's occupying a space so if you block all your spaces with plants which are non supportive towards the local biodiversity then eventually will not get places for the supportive plant yes and and it will doing the scope of you know enhancing the biodiversity around it one example i must state here is lantana camara it you know it's a it's a weed it's a devastating weed in many forests of india and it has played a very negative role and we do admit it along with that lantana is also host for some butterfly now it's a non native plant but many lepidoptera species as a whole and even butterflies they are hosting on that one. and the nectar of lantana being used by the butterflies like it's 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 the old monk of butterflies you know if if you ask a question you know you will get a old monk community among the drinkers so lantana is like old monk for butterflies absolutely most of the people who are drinking they have drunk or they like to you know on a regular basis they will go to lantana now here is a conflict because i know lantana is a invasive species i know it is a problem thing and i also know for my butterflies lantana is something which can support them all through the year so and eventually we are human beings we are working on all these aspects in a various various levels so now we have sterile lantana definitely if you are creating a habitat in and around forest Mm. in and around the place where the forest species are there in abundance close to the forest don't need to put lantana but in a urban settlement settlement where you are into a urban scape you can definitely use this sterile lantana as they cannot propagate you cannot they, people cannot take them and you know put it into forest land and they will start going not like that they, you need to do cutting you need to make saplings out of those lantanas to propagate it so it needs time it's, it it will never happen naturally so in the urban settlement i don't find it wrong to use lantana because it is been used by many many insects on a very profuse manner for their nutritional supplement so a, they, yeah i'm i think it's a very good point that you bring up Uh, so, so, so adapted by the local biodiversity what i want to tell means exactly local, exactly if the local biodiversity is utilizing it who am i to you know take it out of the range it's we have taken it into the range we have taken many uh, plants like lantern and any other things into their domain and just because now we understand that it is not very helpful for us we are trying to throwing it throw it out but with during the last 2 300 years many local biodiversity got dependent on that plant so if, so we have to think very judiciously we cannot just whimsically think that this is weed this is we have to discard this is not weed who has defined this weed and non native native all those things these are human perceptions so you have to understand the you know interlock between this biodiversity element how they are behaving to each other with each other and you have to take a call according to them 
So you have to be very judicious about where you are putting. Ajahn, that's what I'm saying. It's a very good point that you bring up. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, exactly what I was trying to get at. That it's uh, uh, butterfly habitats are not ecological restoration projects. You know, if you're working in a forest on ecological restoration, then uh, of course stay away from invasives. You have to focus on natives. But uh, butterfly gardens are small places of you know joy for people to watch butterflies, right? To try and to enhance the already existing garden space so that more butterflies visit there. So a debate on uh, natives and non-natives goes like beyond the purview of the thing. We have to understand what the butterfly is like and then try and provide that. As simple as that, you know, the, the biodiversity, it has to be useful to the biodiversity. Even Sohel, if you, uh, but I consider we, we, we don't say butterfly gardens for all our gardens. We, in many cases, we say butterfly conservatory. And this is a term again, this is promoted by Sarika a lot. She said, no, these are not only gardens, these are conservatories because we do a lot of things for their conservation. And what I told that even in if you think this is an ecological restoration of a place in a way in urban ecology, urban biodiversity. So butterfly gardens are very important element of you know restoring urban biodiversity and urban ecology. They can be used for used to do that as well. So what I'm telling is you have to understand the cost benefit ratio. Where the cost benefit ratio of lantana is poor. Don't put lantern over there. But where it's not that poor, it's beneficial more than uh, destructive, mm. you can definitely put lantern. So you have to choose things like, you know, there are many things you can say. If you look at these garden varieties, lanterns, you will say there are loads of other plants growing in and around it very naturally. It's not like the wild lantern where you will not see undergrowth, you know, around a lantern bush. Mm. In the garden variety lantern, I can show you in my garden, there are many other agrophyta, auriculata, these and that I have seen growing very close to those plants naturally. So we have altered the lantern to a sterile lantern and we have modified it. So we have modified it for some reason and that is helping the butterfly gardens as well. Definitely sterile lantern was not created to create butterfly garden, but to, you know, create ornamental gardens you know places with flowers throughout the year so you have white uh, you have mauve color you have this and that but the red and yellow lantern the common the commonly seen garden lanterns they're brilliant in you know supporting butterfly diversity various uh, family of butterflies are use used those to also. Yeah, use those plants so you have to be very judicial about uh, that's what i'm telling you have to take the call very judiciously. It's not like lantana, no, lantana, yes. It's about lantana, no, because this th these are the things around. There are plenty of native, not so harmful, or whatever you say. There are availability of other plants which can provide nectar throughout the year. And when where there is no such plants available to provide nectar throughout the year, definitely you can use lantana for the butterflies. Eventually, butterflies will bring in birds. Eventually, many other things will come, and with them, maybe you are st you start getting some native varieties or you know which are not ticked off varieties for nectar in your garden because birds can bring in those seeds from somewhere else. Some other smaller mammals can bring in seeds from somewhere else, and your garden can have those varieties coming up. And as this lantern is not propagating by its own, as this is not growing beyond your control. So you can always take it off, take it off if you want after a while when there are other sources of nectar available in your garden. So you have to take the call in a very judicial way. Uh, Arjun, in the same vein, uh, uh, our discussion has uh, touched upon a lot of questions that we got already. Uh, but one last question from the internet before I get uh, uh, our participants involved. Uh, if you were building a butterfly garden with only native plants, which nectar plant would you be choosing? Or uh, I don't know who had the choose? question, but 
uh, if I uh, if I ask him or her, you give me five native plant name of plants which provide nectar throughout the year. I will be happy to choose any one of them. Even Ixora, Jatropha, uh, Himal Hamelia, Pat Pat Hamelia. You you name a whole lot of nectar plants that are used around. Hardly will find any truly native, hundred percent native variety. Yes. And so there are plants native which can attract loads of butterflies. That we are discussing the this Veiva asiatica, the uh, falsa uh, tree. Falsa, yes, yes. 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 So they they flowers only for a month. So what exactly. will happen? Is seven months. So it's 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 very hard. I mean, if you are making an habitat, uh, so you can argue that in nature what happens. In nature, even you know, you find many unusual things. If you have ventured in into the forest, you will get to see many unusual things happening, and they are already there. Many this tacarfeta, this this particular plant, the jarvash we call another plant. Those are there in our forest, like they are native in the forest for I I don't know how many years, but they are not originally native. They are. Adopted by the local biodiversity, propagated by the local biodiversity, and found their place and providing support for the local insect and eventually to the birds and other uh, higher group of animals. So, yes, Ixora is a very good plant, if you say. But it, again, Ixora chinensis chinensis says that it has some China connection. Uh, there are many many uh, uh, plants which are even you know th those are very very commonly. Even you know the allotropic gigantia. If you try to look at its origin, which is associated with our Lord Shiva, you know you cannot have Shiva puja without uh, this uh, Akondor pool, and yeah. is it is from African origin. So you know now Lord Shiva is of African origin, or we are from Africa. You know it can lead to many <laughs> many things, which is very. And it's very hard to explain. So you don't go by the way we say native and exotic and indigenous and all those things. What I think is better to understand is which is been used by many biodiversity element on a regular basis. Maybe it's a non-native thing, but it is supporting a whole lot of other biodiversity element of your place. Then it's a useful plant for them. You just can't discard it right away. You have to be very, so, very careful about taking the call. So, Arjun, um, uh, very nice. As in, uh, you touched upon really good things with this native and non-native uh, debate. It's always raging whenever we talk oh, about habitats, butterfly yeah, habitats. Yeah, and it's well-intentioned. I see where it comes from. It's well-intentioned. People yeah. are trying to make judicious choices in what they plant, what they don't plant. But uh, like you said, it's time to go beyond this and look for what the butterfly needs or what is supporting biodiversity rather than just what is native, what is non-native. With that, Arjun, I would uh, go to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Shela asked a question, a couple of questions actually. Uh, why did you feel the need to create a lab? You did touch upon it, but if you, why did you feel the need to create a lab? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, a very important question. Uh, the thing is, you know, if you look at the butterflies, if you look uh, look at a butterfly, if you look at their breeding thing, if you go behind the you know behind the scene, how much how many eggs they are laying, what is happening to their larvae, and you know uh, what is happening, how many of them are coming out uh, uh, from egg to you know the mature stage, you'll get to see that only uh, my idea is only 10, 12 percent of them actually become butterfly from egg. So what I found is if, you know, whenever you are doing something with nature, you have to be very, very careful. Even if I want to make that if a butterfly lay 100 eggs and every 100 eggs, I will ensure that 90 of them will come out as butterflies, then that particular species may be vulnerable in that area because of the crowding, because of overpopulation. So you know, you can feel it as a human being for sure. So, so we have to be very careful. We need butterflies. We need 
their number to increase but we cannot do it in a way so that their number goes beyond the level which make that population vulnerable because of the number so in a lab what we do out of the 100 eggs they lay we say we provide in uh, ex situ conservation ex situ support for 20 of them so remaining 80 of 80 of them remains there in the nature in the in situ condition and provide support to all the other life forms that are dependent on butterfly for various reasons in in their various life stages like many most of the birds they prefer to take more than adult butterflies they prefer to take the larvae but some birds like the you know the green beater or some birds like that they uh, the um, uh, falconet colored falconet in our north bengal landscape the, yes. all the beaters in our landscape they prefer to take the adult one the drongo they take everything means yes. from larvae to pupae to adult everything the egrets they prefer the adult one whereas the minas the starlings they always love to take the larvae so we keep the 80 percent of the of the butterfly life stages in nature to support the diversity they are supporting because we are not creating butterfly gardens for just to ensure their leaves a load of loads of butterflies we are also making a butterfly garden to ensure that the overall biodiversity gets enhanced by their presence because they are animals of special uh, you know uh, importance they support a full lot of biodiversity and their presence ensures the overall quality of biodiversity so if i take out all of them from in situ condition to ex situ condition and provide them support then suddenly there will be a when a random increase of our species and then there will be a sharp drop because in that habitat i cannot accommodate plants for all of them and there will be no natural predation because if the number goes like that so we we take out 20 percent 15 to 20 percent of them we ensure 80 percent conversion of that so eventually what happened if i take 20 eggs and out of 20 eggs we get 16 butterflies 80 percent of them get converted and from the 80 we get nine or ten butterflies so instead of getting 12 we are just increasing it by say 100 percent of that but it's again it's only 24 butterflies out of 24 26 butterflies out of 100 so from 12 percent 12 to 14 percent to 20 to 25 percent so this much of increase happened and that actually is a uh, increase which we can accommodate which the local biodiversity can use for their growth as well it's not a sudden jump and that increase allows us to raise the visibility by and large you know suddenly you see, get to see double the number of butterflies in a place in a way without much changes just because you are providing and you know as insects they are having the various life stages the concept of in situ and ex situ conservation fits perfectly with insect groups and reptile groups where there is no parenting so when i'm releasing a butterfly on the day of its emergence it is exactly as it got emerged in the natural setup it is coming out of a box and it, it flew off the box is not there there is maybe under the leaf or from some other anchoring point in nature it happens yeah, in our laboratory it happens uh, in a box so that's that much is the difference and you can change the visibility you can change the uh, number with, with a very managed way it's not you can if you see that uh, even with that 20 percent the number of half species is increasing very rapidly you stop collecting that particular species you give stress on other species so we can manage the whole thing we can do things according to the visibility according to the way they are having they are behaving in nature you know so a lab gives you enormous enormous support for a butterfly garden to you know sustain throughout the year with a good visibility and a, uh, serving the purpose uh, arjun uh, a great great point that you touched upon here 
a uh, lot of students you know well intentioned well um, uh, very well uh, you know familiar with butterflies people who have been working with butterflies for a long time there's a new fad now about saving caterpillars so people go out and uh, i understand rearing but uh, butterflies i have also reared butterflies to study life cycle to uh, understand more about butterflies but this concept of saving caterpillars is actually very irritating i keep telling my uh, students that no uh, you're not saving them you have to be very clear about what you are doing you're trying to understand these butterflies there's no point saving butterflies from minas their food for minas they have to they have to eat <laughs> ha in bengali there is a term called nakamo so in wildlife study i i hate nakamo you know in parenthesis so you cannot do that when it it's irritating you try to save a deer from tiger you try to save a fish from a crocodile you try to save larva from a common minor and you are actually spoiling the whole ecosystem and eventually you are spoiling the survival of butterfly so you you don't get into the natural thing okay for your study purpose you do study a uh, or two but that too even you can be attached with some butterfly gardens like ours you are most welcome to study it over there you, you know individual study has very less value there are people who are doing some good uh, you know communications and all but most of the people they are just doing it for the sake of doing it sake of fun you can do it once twice but it's not i don't appreciate that much because you have to do it in a very constructive manner if you are doing it if you are taking yes. a life in your hand you have to be very very responsible and you have to be very very careful what i said in the beginning sometime that now we do butterfly collection but when i am taking a life i have to ensure that specimen should be there for at least 200 years to be used for research purpose i went to the natural history museum london i have seen specimens from 1760 1788 1830 like that means 2 300 years old specimen they are still people are using yes. them for their study so a life taken which is serving even after 200 years has to end the value but a life taken for the sake of understanding how to pin butterfly and then you spoil it it's criminal offense i hate that exactly there are people there are teachers who are you know who are making their students uh, you know knowledgeable about these things without minimum respect towards the insect whatever it's not about only butterfly yes it's about absolutely. spoon and everything collection is a mania it, it's bad the way most of the people do because they don't keep the collection properly they don't submit it to a proper authority where the collection gets its own value that life gets its own value whenever i am taking a life i cannot create life i am nowhere near to create a life so when i am taking a life i have to be very very responsible i have to do it very man a rightful way so that that life gets its value for next 200 years and serve the purpose of being that particular species and make us learn it about that particular species to to very very well said that's it very well said let me get back to uh, questions from the audience there's a few questions from swastika uh i have some question do the butterflies only interact with each other during mating time or at different instances as well ah uh, they do interact with each other in many many ways yeah. you know there are interspecies them fighting <laughs> uh, interspecies in species interaction in intraspecies interaction what i told the my first story in japan this dog fighting this is a fight between two males and they are showcasing their you know brilliant metallic color of their upper wing to the women around so they do interact in uh, in many ways and uh, i think uh, so hell we have a we have a day for discussing beyond butterfly checklisting or something so on yes. that day i will definitely put many ideas in front of you so that one can start enjoying butterfly in a very new way from day uh, after the day and yes they do interact for various other reason it's not about mating mating is okay mating is a very interesting aspect of butterfly uh, life uh, butterfly life and you know uh, if you compare mating of butterfly with human mating we are like we are we are just 
nowhere near to them. The blue tiger mates for 14 to 16 hours. <laughs> Just think of that. <laughs> if you ask about the question. So butterflies are fascinating, you know. They do the mating overnight. So they usually start their mating at around 3, 3 30, 4 around. And next day morning, they actually get out of the copulation. So mating, very interesting. There are many, many interesting other facts you can get to know. Other about behaviors, the yes. Oh, they will first start. But yes, they do interact. But they interact a lot. The pansies are worst chasers. The great egg fly, one of my most favorite butterfly, one of the butterfly that brings me into butterflying in my very early days because I was fascinated by its beauty. They are, you know, in, in a forest, if you get to see a great egg fly around, you can be sure of that you are going to lose some new, not so good photographed butterfly in your closet. Again, because that will chase it away for sure. If you know, if, but so uh, are, Arjun, uh, again, uh, you touched upon this very important thing here that uh, people hardly realize that solitary insects are not behavior of solitary solitary insects is not studied at all. We know about bees, we know about termites, of course, bigger mammals and all that. But insects, there's no hardly uh, people don't even realize that they have behaviors. No, 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 they do realize, but they don't get into that trouble because, you know, studying a solitary insect will take, you know, will challenge you a lot. It's very easy to study things which get back to a place every night or, you know, but to study a thing which never get back to the same place in most of the cases is very hard. So to actually study a sample size which gives you a, you know, data set which is worthy of you know publication and other things it may take years of effort so people those who even understand the value of it don't try to you know usually avoid to get into it because it, it, it's not an easy thing to do right but it's yeah. wonderfully when it, if you do it it's wonderful you will enjoy it a lot but it's not an easy thing the second follow-up question to this was is there any code courtship display or sexual preference strategies in butterflies as in different animal groups that decides their color variation in their wings. Yes, yes. Then uh, the same way the butterfly also flaunt their colors. Uh, you know, there is a uh, thing called hair pencils, which spreads pheromen. So many male butterfly will see flying with their erected hair pencils. They, they, you, you go to butterflies like the purple emperor, they, change their color with every turns and rotations. So they, they do a lot of things to get attracted by the female or get the attention of the female, like many other uh, uh, creatures in nature. So they do a lot of things. And they, they do a courtship display. There are, you will see in a butterfly like Quaker, when there is a mating pair, there are two, three, more, four males uh, surrounding them and try to, you know, uh, connect with the female even when the female is already connected with the male at, uh, with one male so you will get to see a whole lot of things if you are studying them Arjun there is another question here by uh, Priya Khandelwal she is asking are there any groups who do all these activities in Rajasthan if you know any I can take this up she, uh, Priya you can write to bigbutterflymonth at uh, gmail.com and we will surely connect you with somebody in the network yeah, there are lots of people uh, working with butterflies in Rajasthan. And but of course, uh, there will be people about this, I think, Sohel, but not only for Rajasthan, now BBM is connected with almost all the states. So anyone from any other state, if having the same question, you just strike to us, we will definitely connect you to people who are working at your area. So there's another question. Uh, uh, have you seen any behavioral changes in recent times in any of the species of butterfly to cope with the rising temperature and pollution? Uh, can, I, can you repeat the question? I missed. Uh, Have you seen any behavioral changes in recent times in any of the species of butterflies to cope with rising temperature and pollution? Basically, have you seen any changes in butterflies due to... You know, uh, we have seen changes in butterfly diversity and abundance, but behavioral change, it is very hard to document in that way. 
So yes. climate change is it, it's it's something again a very you know there are plenty of lacun in uh, dealing with this subject because climate is not something you can uh, deal uh, where you can uh, say uh, things have changed in last ten years. It's a million years database that need to be considered. You know, you cannot just say climate changing is happening, this and that is happening in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years. Yes. 15 years is in, in no way a time scale for saying anything about climate change. And butterfly study as a whole, you know, in India, I, I, I will not say in other places, but as a whole in India, it has a gap post independence. There is a gap of almost 40, 45 years that we have not studied butterfly the way the Britishers used to study butterflies of Indian subcontinent. They did mostly documentation and they did mostly the diversity study with some association with their, you know, altitude variation, local endemicity, etc. and that, etc. But since mid to 19, 19, since say 1995 onwards, the whole uh, texture of butterfly study, butterfly research in India start changing. And during the last 20, 25 years, we have seen a lot of things happening, but we are yet to say anything regarding the habit change of butterflies due to climate change. But definitely we are seeing many groups of butterflies as what, what is happening, climate change, it affects the plant life mostly, you know, the flowering time is altered, the new leaves are coming either earlier or later, and with all these things, butterfly life is closely associated. So definitely climate change has an impact. So if you go by egg laying behavior, yes, we have seen some changes, but you know, we, we need to study a lot more before saying anything constructive. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, actually, uh, one of the reasons of uh, starting something like Big Butterfly Month is exactly the same, you know, we won't Absolutely. Uh, eventually, maybe after 10, 20 years, uh, maybe you and I won't be here for all that, but uh, there will be some data around butterflies and we can answer questions like these, important questions oh. like these. Uh, oh. There's one last question before I ask people to raise their hands and uh, ask you questions directly, or me, in fact. Uh, why do butterfly species have preferred host plants and what is special about those plant species? You know, if you, uh, you know, we, we are very much interested in celebrity life. Huh? So we always take a look at what is happening with various celebrities. Even now, in 2021, if you look, in the, uh, look uh, close to them, you will get to see that during the, when they are about to give birth to their child, they prefer to go back to their mother's place. You know, anything and everything, when they are about to create their applicant, create their own siblings, their own babies, own future generation, they are very, 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 you know, defensive. So, like I said, like me, I'm a big time foodie. So I say, Arjun, you're on mute. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you're back. So in my locality, there is a new Thai restaurant. I'm going there to try. Definitely, I will try. But when is when there is a matter when I need to sleep somewhere, I'm I'm a bit skeptical because you know the toilet, the bed, who is sitting beside me, you know the temperature, what he or she is maintaining is may not be of my choice. So like that. These host plants, how they selected it, they selected it for various reasons. They use the plants not only for the nutrition purpose, they also use plants for the defensive mechanism. They use the plants for many other factors which is known and which is still yet to be known. But once they have selected that plant and when they are sure about the success of their breeding with that plant, they tend to stick to that plant they don't like to change that particular thing. They may try a new nectar plant, they may try a new place for roosting, mm. but there is a matter of when, you know, they are they don't do parenting. 
so they lay the egg in a way where they are assured of that their larvae are going to have a meal immediately after they are out of the egg shell so they are not very you know um, adventurous with selecting of host plants now i am not the right person to tell you about how and when they exactly have selected the host plant for how they have selected their host plant maybe krishna may can answer in one of our webinar in the recent time when uh, you can no, but like you rightly it. said uh, it's a part of lots of things some of the things we know like defense mechanism like a plain tiger would uh, go on alkaloids uh, stuff like that but there's so much more to know yeah we i i at least for me i don't know much i i but i know that they're not at all adventurous when it's a question of selecting your host plant they are preferring the plants which they know well and which they their their genetic setup is you know they are definitely all all the creatures you know they have their genetic set, setup they have their certain things embedded in their gene and they know how to find it out they they are one of the best botanists you can you, you will be mesmerized by their skill of you know uh, finding plants they are, they are they are absolutely stunning in their ability I, I mean, we either we look for butterflies or we look for plants. And if there is a plant which hosts a very rare butterfly, you, there is no point in chasing butterfly. You just sit behind that plant. One day, two day, maybe a week or two, you will get to see that butterfly in that habitat if it is there in the habitat. So in forest, well, we are chasing butterflies. If we get a good plant which hosts a very special butterfly, stop chasing butterflies. Stay put beside that plant the butterfly is coming they are brilliant in you know they are one of the finest botanists yes, yes. and and, and yeah, that actually, is i think there is for butterflies and caterpillars it's best to know host plants and you can you know in the wild it's really easy and and the larvae travel uh, say 100 150 meters to find new host plants we have we have uh, documented so uh, the, those are the things which is happening when uh, we have to we have to look at them more and more and we have to understand their ability we have to respect their ability a lot because there are many things hidden uh, in their natural behavior which may lead to enhancement of our knowledge to a very very different level in the long run arjun there's one last question if you could quickly answer this one could you tell us how butterflies survive in cold regions in 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 different uh, life stages like you know in, in the if you know the monarchs the monarchs are able to survive even at the, as butterflies and they can withstand the cold as butterflies in 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 our high altitude region there are small lycenids which survive in form of egg during the winter and they come out from the egg when the new leaves are there in the trees so they manage their winter winter period hibernating period different different species manages it in different different life stages so thank you thank you arjun for that uh, answer here arjun i would like uh, to tell our audience that this is part of uh, our many part series on habitat but of habitats for butterflies and uh, actually we are going to come out with a, a form for people to fill out a google form for people to fill out where we are actually inviting people who want to build habitats who have yes. some place in mind be it their terrace or be it a local colony garden or be it a, their education institute or a place their work a plant or a hospital wherever they feel that they can build a habitat and they want to work with butterflies and build, use uh the knowledge they have to a practical use of actually having habitats uh, you can do it in your house or you could do it outside but if you're interested we'll be floating out a google form which you can fill out and we will subsequently build workshops for you and uh, try and uh, you know by next year have these habitats ready uh, to welcome butterflies arjun would you like to add something uh, about what we are intending to do with these workshops 
uh, those are simple workshop we will uh, discuss about the size shape and your intention and according to the intention capacity and and everything we will uh, discuss various kind of habitats that you can create even you can create you, you can extend one habitat like you have a small habitat in form of a park around your place that park may not have all the elements which is uh, elements needed for the butterfly diversity in that area so you can even by planting a or two plants in your balcony can extend that habitat to your balcony and help the butterfly diversity to thrive so we will discuss all these things even uh, our plant can help in extending habitat or we can create a habitat for a small diversity or we can create a habitat for a large diversity maybe 100 species we can create in habitat even in urban places we have created so i can say that it's possible and uh, swell can uh, swell will be discussing about this there is uh, two of our friends who are very really good in creating habitats and doing it for years now samilan and uh, dr sab they will also be joining if possible uh, and we will be discussing uh, on various aspects of creating habitat so those who have been interested in you know building habitats in and around your places workplace your home your balcony your terrace a place uh, of uh, you know in your ancestral place in the village where from you belong anywhere any size any shape we can create habitat for butterflies and other things and we will be discussing all those things uh, arjun on the same note i j i missed a question sorry uh, the question was from uh, raja bose and the question was do you think all schools need to have a small butterfly habitat i think all the places must support either be a butterfly habitat or support the butterfly habitat nearby so that we can create a matrix where the butterfly get to move around through your city through your village through your area where you live and they can live happy so definitely yes if there is a place a butterfly garden is a wonderful place for learning the students can enjoy they can learn a loads of things they can be passionate about doing research on any other animal forms in the long run just by working in a butterfly garden or maintaining a butterfly garden interacting in a butterfly garden so definitely yes i i really really love to have all our schools having a small area where there are considerations for butterfly at least if not the full full habitat you just think of a butterfly put a plant it's a habitat Absolutely, and I, I should add, uh, Arjun uh, Raja Bose himself uh, has built a butterfly, a very uh, awesome butterfly habitat in his school. So uh, people are really interested, and I think it's a great. Then sorry. I, uh, that's wonderful. Then yeah, this effort must be praised because you know. Yeah, so this these kind of efforts can be replicated, and as you rightly said, in our country now it's happening all over. I think it's. Uh, great opportunity for everybody to you know come together and share the knowledge we have and try and propagate such habitats and uh, people learning from these habitats i think that's also a very important aspect of uh, creating these habitats it's a two way thing you are not creating anything out of your own learning it it you are creating while you are learning from them how they are thriving exactly so, exactly a wonderful way of interacting with nature and you know it's 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 wonderful so mr arabos it, it's commendable that you have created a habitat and we will love to know about that habitat as well uh, so well we can actually uh, uh, say about what our plan is so uh, after this pbm we are planning to have a year long you know monitoring of various habitat created by various people even those who will be starting a uh, butterfly habitat after this bbm itself and we will try to have a very detailed idea of each and every habitat possible and if, uh, during the next bbm we will we may have some you know mm. surprise from for surprises for all those habitats which are doing actually arjun well. you are really right uh, uh, i hope to see uh, next year's bbm with uh, a, it's 
see it as a platform for so many people who are working with habitats you know small schools small gardens give them a platform to actually tell people about their journey and how they came to butterflies and how they have built habitats and what they are doing to spread the message i think it's a really uh, great time uh, to be a butterfly watcher that there is no magic there is no orjon's recipe sohel's recipe isaac's recipe or krishna makes recipe or tarika's recipe it's it's a two way of learning so all the garden if we share our findings if we share our knowledge with each other we will actually enhance our knowledge in a in the long absolutely. run absolutely there is absolutely. nothing to hide nothing nothing to keep personal there is no tricks nothing it's all about a uh, fruitful learning from nature from the thing we love the most from our butterflies and share the thoughts among each other that is the intention of bbm that is the intention of this talk and you know that's why i mean that's my sole intention that yes we have to share we have to learn and we have to ensure that we live among butterflies then we will be yes. happy absolutely that is our purpose yes so this i would um, uh, uh, urge everybody to take up this opportunity if you've been thinking of building a habitat if you think you want to build a habitat if you haven't thought about it and today was your first day thinking about it do give it a serious thought uh, do write to us to come back to us we would like to help uh, we would like to extend all the help uh, that we can uh, at our end uh, not just me arjun vijay big butterfly month uh people organizing that but other experts uh, who we know of who are doing the same you'd like to bring them to people interested uh in creating habitats and i hope lot of you do take up this opportunity and uh, start thinking about plants and butterflies very very seriously uh shantanu has a question uh, is actually a request he's saying can you please create a downloadable resource for the habitat creation I think Shan, yes, we'll be working on that. Uh, we want to get more and more people involved and really understand what uh, kind of resource they really want. I can. But actually, yeah, but the way we are uh, planning to conduct the workshop, there will be downloadable resource from each and every individual after the workshop because we will be collecting ideas from each and everybody. As I mentioned, there is no set prescription for habitat. There are a set of things. that the habitats need we will be discussing all those and if we can accommodate all those basic things in a habitat the butterflies will come so for localities for elevations like you know you are creating a butterfly garden on the 13th floor and you are creating a butterfly garden on the first floor it will have some differences the size will have some differences it's a big garden you can have many other things in a small garden you have to be very focused with a uh, smaller number of species so there will be whole lot of you know interconnected things that need to be considered so there will be no such downloadable thing i think chandanu in the long run but there will be definitely some set of instructions that need to be followed while you are conceiving a uh, you know when while you are planning for a butterfly habitat definitely those things will be there but no set of you know downloadable things i don't think i don't believe in that thing or while creating a butterfly garden exactly exactly with that arjun uh, uh, let me ask the uh, audience uh, if they would like to personally ask you some questions if there are no questions then uh, let me close my, this uh, point my email id and my phone number you can find it in google as well so uh, please do write to us write to nature means write to bbm and uh, we are always here to you know discuss things i definitely i am not a person to teach you anything but i am definitely i can share my ideas with you i can learn from you and i can help you learning from nature from butterflies how to absolutely wonderful arjun yeah, does anybody ha- uh, okay there's a hand raised raja uh, would you want to ask a question yeah uh, very good evening arjun sir and sohel madan sir this is raja bose from bhagalpur bihar okay Yeah. Uh, uh very good evening and i was very keenly actually going through this session and you know that i am so interested in butterflies and uh, before asking my question i 
would definitely say Arjun sir was so right that uh, Japanese people are so enthusiastic about any subject, uh, whether it be a butterfly, because I have a cactus and succulent garden. Just uh, in a nutshell, let me tell you this. When uh, they came to visit my garden 10 years back, they had this long, long uh, high definition uh, movie cameras and cameras uh, carrying Laika and Mamiya stuff. And if people from my uh, place I invited, they, they just came and saw and said, Raja, this is good. This is a good uh, succulent or cacti from uh, Africa or South Africa or Madagascar. But they came. They gave around three, four hours to each particular plant to study how they are thriving in Bhagalpur, coming all the way from Madagascar and South Africa. So I was like astonished and I was like so deeply touched by their true professionalism and interest. So now coming back to, yeah. So now coming back to my question, sir, I have, I have created a, a small uh, butterfly garden in my school. So my question is, uh, I just uh, go through a lot of groups where I see that uh, people growing pagoda, Jamaican spike, or say Aspalesi, Kuruzuvika, or the red milkweed flowers. I tried since growing them since one year in my school place, but because of my climatic factors, I'm very unable to grow them. So my first question is, could you please suggest alternative to these plants? And the second is, However, organic method, I'm trying to cope up with mealybugs because you know that if you create an urban biodiversity, there is an attack of mealybugs. So I'm trying all the good ways of uh, tackling with mealybugs through organic way. I'm very unsuccessful. So if you could guide me because you know I cannot use insecticide or pesticide in my garden. Obviously. Obviously. So, yeah. So, right, yeah, one thing you can try, you yeah. can try crushed ice on the mealybugs. Okay. It, it can give you a very good result. You yeah. just, you know, you brush the mice and put it, wrap it, wrap the mealybugs with the ice. For okay, some time. sir. Okay. And it, it helps. Uh, okay. Uh, it's hundred percent, but it helps. Okay. You can also use, uh, uh, you know, chili powder spray. Yeah. Since you just have some chili powder. In yeah. It. Yeah. I. I. I, I, I yeah. I did it, it with neem oil, sir. No, neem oil, I think these millibugs are smart enough. They are now exactly. good with neem oil and <laughs> you yeah. can use powder and, you know, cold water is a very good solution for them, I found. Okay. So it's from my area, this is my experience. Yeah. And uh, regarding alternatives for the plants, I will definitely like to discuss with you about the place and the climate and the you know positioning of the garden. Okay, because sir. all the things matters a lot. Maybe yeah. the plant which is not growing at your garden in a particular location, if you just right. change the location, it grow. Very okay. true, sir. Very so true. You have to look at the you know position of the garden, how the sun yeah. is invading it, you know, at uh, how how long it is invading it, where you yes, are sir. putting the plant, and you have to value a lot the plant associations. Maybe we have we, we don't know. I, mean, I I don't know either. But uh, like I may like you, I may not like you. So when we are in a same we are in the same class. Yeah. We always tend to sit beside people of my choice. Huh? So True. plants are also very choosy. So yeah. It may be a case that where you are putting the plants with wrong company and okay, hence sir. you are failing to propagate them. So okay, we sir. have to consider all those factors. In my in our next uh, you know next day's workshop, I yeah. will discuss all these aspects. I will be definitely soil will also yeah, because of... because I I discussed with Sohel sir uh, that uh, I saw common jasmine nectaring on my Nelimbo nucifera that is the Indian lotus plant in my garden which was never been mentioned in any book or copy book that uh, uh, lotus can be a nectaring plant so I was amazed to see that actually when I, what whatever is documented I believe it is 0.1 percent of what can be documented yes so. And, and and all these things like this, uh, we always tend to write, you know, scientific papers, this and that. But I'm, I must say that like what you have seen, like yeah. the lotus being used by a butterfly for nectaring, yeah. you can just write it as a popular science article and, you know, float it. So yeah. all these things, this particular observation, if you want to write a short note on this, yeah. It will be tough, you know. You will hardly get a publisher who will be publishing that short note with our observation. But 
if you write it for a popular science thing it will definitely be published and there will be a documentation that raja has documented this long back that this is been used you know you are not going to get a uh, impact factor for that but impact of your work will be there for long Long, true, yes. sir. So, true. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Many doubts have been cleared. Thank you so much. And uh, I, 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 my number is shared in the chat box. You can find me in Google as well. I have so, already saved that number, sir, because I'm I, very interested in... I will in... Love to back with you because, you know, yeah. you are in a different geography and I want to listen to you, how you are dealing with your problems and... Definitely, sir. Questions from you as well, the long run. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Shana, thank, thank you for your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Nisha, would you like to ask your question? You can un unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Nisha, Hello. you're audible. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, so basically, my question uh, was regarding the abundance because uh, now, as we observe the butterflies in our uh, nearby areas, uh, in certain times of the year, we could able to see so many butterflies, even the species varies and their abundance is also very high compared to the other parts of the year. So what could be the possible reason for such kind of variation in different seasons? So look, uh, butterflies are blessed because we only have one, when we, we came as human being and die as human but the butterfly, they came as the egg then they became the caterpillar, then they have a brilliant, you know, thing called pupa where the whole metamorphosis happens, and then you get to see the adult one. Now, we are only interested about the adult thing. But every stage of this life form has its own choices. So, depending on the temperature and other climatic variables, uh, the egg stage may say, I'm very comfortable in this weather, so I will be an egg for the next three months. <laughs> so you will not see the butterfly, but the butterfly is there in form of an egg. And then the caterpillar comes out and he said, oh, it's too hot, I will not be a caterpillar for long. So instead of seeing them for two weeks in general, you can get to see them for a week and, you know, they get pupated. And the pupa said, oh, my dress that I'm preparing for the adult stage will be ruined if I allow it to go out in this rusty weather. So I will keep that within me for the next 15, 20, maybe a week extra or maybe a few months extra. And then the butterfly comes out and, you know, find its mate, find green leaves and lay eggs and the whole thing happens like that. So when you are not seeing a butterfly, you can be sure of, you can see either it in form of larva or it of an egg or in form of a pupa in usual places, in unusual places, in places where you can't even imagine a butterfly life stage is hanging around. So you have to be very open. Okay. So a butterfly is not just a butterfly. It's a egg, it's a larvae, it's a pupae or a butterfly. So in either form, they are in that habitat in a, in a place where you can think that they can be or in a place where you can't even imagine that they can be. Okay, so that's what happened. Yes, sir. So uh, I have, uh, I have yeah, just please. one. Yeah, a few weeks ago, now uh, I have received a mail from I don't remember the person, but I have received a mail regarding the butterfly counting something like that, and uh, in that they have also clearly mentioned like. Birds, uh, butterflies do migrate in um, during different seasons and between the regions like the heart or the between the states or something like that. So uh, they were counting. Uh, they have you know uh, sent an Excel sheet in which they have mentioned about your locations, your temperature, and what kind of butterflies you are observing, and uh, during which time, like in the morning, in the afternoon, or in the evening time. So like. What I was, uh, I have not filled that, but I have just gone through the Excel sheet and I was not able to understand because, like, we have uh, used to see these butterflies not throughout um, the seasons in our area. So, like, is there any specific kind of butterflies to migrate? Like, I have read about monarch and all the things. Uh, but it's, in, it's, yeah. in our in our in our place also, uh, we have uh, some species which do migrate. 
mostly from the same family which the monarch belongs to the danites you know the tigers in in our case we have the blue tiger the dark blue tiger the common crow the crow and the uh, tigers they do migrate in some regions in you know from western ghats to eastern ghats to some corridors in cases not much of uh, butterfly migration is documented in northeastern region but i believe there is some pattern also mainly in periods what i believe i believe i am i have no constructive data set right with me right now with me so i can say much about this but yes some of the butterflies do migrate who have the capacity capability and who are you know protected naturally like all these butterflies who are into migration they are mostly non palatable ones the monarch is a non palatable butterfly the tigers and crows who migrate who are known to migrate in indian subcontinent as well are non palatable butterflies because you know when you are migrating you are flying in a non forested area in open areas for long so if you are palat if crows are palatable butterflies they are vulnerable from predation so there are many things associated with migration and movements and other things so they are well camouflaged either they are protected by some uh, chemicals within okay so this is a uh, this is a very big subject and you need to learn it from people who are more knowledgeable than me and you also start reading because you know there are certain uh, papers where you can get to know about you know butterfly migration from western ghats to eastern ghats you can search it in google and if you want to know something more about this you can contact us we can put you into the right put you in touch with the right people who are working on this aspect yes raja thank you sir so i just uh, want to ask you one very important question i missed actually that these days i see lot of people rearing butterfly in boxes in their house but when i just started doing it i observed that uh, uh, physiologically or physically somewhat they are not getting as much strength as they occur naturally so would you suggest that uh, rearing in boxes is a good practice or i shouldn't be termed as a rearer to a killer so uh, please suggest very, me sir very very important aspect if you if you taking something in your hand you are taking a very important responsibility if you True, do sir. it responsibly then you can even rear butterflies with good health but if you are doing it for fun at the end of the day instead of providing them support you are actually ruining their future so i don't support rearing which are individualistic which are for you know isolate learning True, i sir. i i do rear a lot of butterflies not i as a group we do rear a lot of butterflies in very well maintained lab where there is no gap we don't we we work there for 6 days a week without any failure and the day we don't work on a regular basis alternatively we visit the facility so that there is nothing happening we maintain the temperature we maintain the surroundings we maintain the quality of leaf and we do it in a way that we are when we have taken the responsibility we have to take the responsibility in the best possible way very so true if sir you it, if you do it like that if you are serious about it if you are really that you have observed so i i can easily understand that you are very much into the subject you are passionate about them so unless otherwise don't do rearing yeah somewhat i thought that sir what is sport to the cat is death to the rat actually so Absolutely. so you you only do rearing if you have dedicated manpower to handle that if you have dedicated manpower who know how to handle that right sir who understand you know i i am talking about sarika a lot because i have learned a lot of thing from her yeah you know one day sarika told me that one of the larvae i think it has got constipation i said okay now the larvae has got constipation okay fine i i value her i value her words a lot because you know she is she is she is having definite definite insights uh, around these things it's natural it it you cannot learn all these things and eventually sarika tap the larvae for a prolonged time on its back like this and by doing something something you know you cannot explain 
and yeah. actually food. And you know, True. after that, it's again, it's quite, you know, acting. Exactly. So you know, you have to understand that even a larvae can have constipation. You have very true, sir. In, they are just like us in various various levels. True. Got it. They are insect and we are human beings. No, they are a life form and we are a life form. So the basic thing to survive as a life are more or less common. True, so, sir. You know, uh, if you, it's too hot, it's problem for everybody. If it's too cold, it's problem for everybody. There is a comfort zone. You have to value that comfort zone. If right, we need sir. good food, if we need fresh food, they need fresh food. I just cannot give them leaves. I have to give them good leaves which they can eat. Exactly. And we have to take care of many other things. Only if you have a dedicated manpower who are passionate, who are not working for money, who are working for the cause, you do rare. Otherwise, don't. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the question, Raja. And uh, with that, uh, Arjun, I would like to end today's session. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Arjun, for such a wonderful... You know, I uh, hadn't heard your Japan story ever. It was eye-opener for me. And of course, all the questions taken up were interesting. And there's so many people here. We... Uh, wanted a small group with this interaction and I think uh, those two show they've stayed for two hours listening to uh, a chat about uh, habitats, butterflies and all the things around them. So a big thank you to everybody who participated and yeah. I would really again urge all of you to uh, think about creating habitats be it a small garden in your house or anything just get into it and uh, uh, of course, Arjun, me and others uh, in the BBM group would love to uh, help you out and do as much as we can to you know, support your uh, adventure in building these habitats. So with that, uh, Arjun, would you like to say something uh, before we end the thing? Uh, hello. Arjun would no, I would like to see many of them from today's talk uh, during the workshop. And, uh, and you know, Raja, you please be there because you can help the workshop be a success workshop with your, you know, valuable input because you are doing it. Uh, Absolutely right. Absolutely right, Arjun. So stay tuned for uh, announcements for further workshops. There'll be weekend workshops usually. And we would like to see all of you and more people, if you know of, get them uh, interested and get them to fill the form. Uh, the form will be a little specific about things you, uh, resources you are dealing with. And we would try and help you out on a case to case basis and showcase all your habitats to the wider, uh, to a wide, wider audience. And of course, to uh, across the nation. Now we are uh, in all the states, in all the union territories, and uh, uh, with support from like-minded people like uh, we have today here, uh, I think BBM is going to go from uh, place to place, uh, bigger, better things. So thank you for coming today, and thank you, Arjun. Thank you, Nature Mates, for organizing this thing, and uh, Shantanu, Krishna Meg, Vijay, of course, everybody who's been involved. Uh, we have Dr. Milin Bhakrev, on our uh, habitat team and uh, he's suffering from corona so he couldn't be with us but uh, we would try and get him uh, hope he recovers very well and we we'll try and get him here for you he's done excellent work there's uh, would be a talk coming up uh, by some Milan Shetty also we are also trying to get <coughs> Isaac sir to uh, talk about his terrace garden and how he uh, still gets excited when a common rose visits his plants. So all that and more, stay tuned for that. Uh, follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and all our talks are going to go on YouTube. So you can go anytime to the Big Butterfly Month uh, India channel. And uh, last year's talks and this year's talks, they're all there. It's a repository of information, like-minded experts, amateurs, all were invited to give talks. and. Uh, it's a great resource where you can uh, go back to again and again with any doubts you have. So 
uh, thank you everybody good night and uh, hope to see you all of you very soon thank you thank you everybody thank you arjun thank you everybody